takes courage to be a great person and to do great things with God, and courage begins with a single step. You know, things sometimes when in our spiritual lives don't always make sense. We believe, especially in this church, that God is for you. He's not against you. We believe God has the victory for you. We believe God is going to get you through what you're going through. But often in that process, we can feel confused when bad things happen. And we can wonder, where is God in the midst of all of this? And I have a very dramatic but true answer to that looming question. And the answer is, this is war. And what I mean by that is, we are not, as Christians, in a physical war. We're in a spiritual war. There is a spiritual fight going on over your soul and over the destiny of the world. And we know Jesus Christ has won and will win. Yet, we still are in the midst of a real spiritual struggle. I've been on enough missionary trips. I've seen enough miracles. I have seen enough crazy spiritual things to believe with all my heart this is a spiritual battle. And I don't understand it. I simply trust. In the Bible, the book of Daniel, there's this story where Daniel is praying to God for three weeks and is not getting a response. And nothing's happening. And he's wondering what's going on. And one day, an angel appears before him so terrifying that everybody that's with Daniel runs away. And Daniel stands there sort of paralyzed. And the angel says, essentially, Daniel, God sent me here to you. But I was delayed, the Bible says, because the prince of Persia, we, had, we think of that as a, like, a, a, like a demon or something, that this, this thing was stopping me, and so we were fighting. And I had to fight him to get to you, and we were at an impasse. And so Archangel Michael came and aided me and helped me break through so that I could get through, and we had the victory, and now I'm here to tell you this message from God there is a lot going on in the spiritual realms that we don't always get. And part of living as a believer, when we have crystal clear eyes to see in this world, but at best a foggy vision of the spiritual world that impacts this world, we are called to live with trust, to grow in knowledge, and to act with courage. To be brave. And you are brave. And I'm proud of you. Because war requires courage. And war, I know, is a word that's taboo, but that's exactly what it is. We are fighting on the side of light against the darkness. And so, whatever it is that you're bringing to God today, face it with courage and step towards the thing you're afraid of, not away. Courage is doing what you are afraid to do. And courage says, I'm going to move not away from, but in the direction of the thing that scares me. And that's who you are. That's what courage is. It's doing what you're afraid to do. You're so brave. You have so much heart. And that's what the word courage is rooted in the French word, cur, to have heart. To have heart, to have guts. To face what it is that's coming after you. So what do you have coming after you? You have a surgery? You have uh, a sick kid? Uh, maybe it means standing up to a bully. Maybe for your courage this week is going to be having that talk that you've needed to have for a long time with that particular person. Maybe courage is asking a girl for her phone number. Whatever it is, I know this. An extraordinary life requires extraordinary courage. And you have it. And I'm proud of you. You're not afraid. You're not a weakling. You're strong. And you will step in the direction of the thing you're afraid of. And you will have the victory. And that's what makes it so sweet. The victory, right? The victory. You're going to have the victory. Step in the direction of the thing you're afraid of. Because it's the only thing standing between you and your victory. In Jesus' name. His name 
is the name that gives us courage. If anything can give you courage, let it be the bravest human being that has ever lived, Jesus Christ. A lot of people don't know this, but the story of Lazarus and entering Jerusalem are essentially connected into one narrative in the Gospel of John. In John, you have this story. There's uh, three people, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And the three of them are siblings, and they're friends with Jesus. And Jesus gets word that uh, Lazarus is sick. They say, come heal Lazarus, and Jesus delays for two days. Finally, it's like he just comes to it, and he says, we have to go to Bethany to heal Lazarus. Now, here's something you need to know. This is towards the end of the story of the Gospels. Jesus is already getting famous, and he knows if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to die. You're going to get crucified. So he knows this. He's carrying this worry with him. And Bethany, where Lazarus lives, is like a suburb of Jerusalem. It's one and a half miles from the city. It's a 20-minute walk. And so it's basically going to Jerusalem when you go to Bethany. Not quite, but very close. And so he says to his disciples, Guys, we got to go heal Lazarus. And they say to him, If we go there, they're going to kill you. And almost somberly, Jesus looks at them and says, Our friend Lazarus is sleeping. I need to go and wake him. And then still trying to talk him out of it, they say, But Rabbi, if he's sleeping, I mean, you want a sick guy to sleep. You know, don't wake him up. He's, you know, sick. Won't he get well? And then the Bible says, he just told those knuckleheads plainly. He said, Lazarus is dead. And then there's, you kind of catch that there's this silence. Lazarus, they're all friends with him, is dead. Jesus wants to go there. They're not sure why. And you can get this looming sense like, Jesus is going to die. Are we going to get the axe too? And I always love this because it's Thomas Didymus, also known as Doubting Thomas because of his response later in the story, one of the bravest and one of my favorite characters in the Bible, he looks at the disciples and he says, let us go that we may die with him. Yes! <laughs> I love that. That's courage. That's heart. And you don't see the disciples' response, but you can see they're kind of like, all right. All right. <laughs> so they go to Bethany. And when they get there, Lazarus has been dead for four days. And because he was a super popular guy, there were a lot of Jews there, and they were all mourning and weeping. There could have been hundreds, maybe thousands of people there. His sister Martha comes out to Jesus, totally broken up. She says, Lord, if you had if you'd just been here, you could have saved my brother. She says to him, Martha, your brother will rise again. And she kind of says, I know, I know, he will rise again in the last day of the resurrection. He looks at her and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will not die, but will surely live forever. Pull the stone away. They say, Lord, we can't pull the stone away. He already stinks. That's what the Bible says. He's been dead for four days, and we live in a desert. <laughs> pull the stone away. And they do, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. With hundreds of people there who were there to mourn his death who were there for a dirge, weeping. Lazarus comes out in his burial clothes and starts tearing them off. And the last thing comes off is that thing from his face. And he's eye to eye with Jesus, his best friend. And he is alive. And everybody freaks out. <laughs> Word spreads like crazy. It's the last huge miracle Jesus does. And everybody hears about it. It gets to the temple priests and the Pharisees. And they say, we need to kill this guy. Why? In the scriptures it says, we're afraid that he'll become so popular that Rome will take the temple away from us. And then there's this bizarre story where a guy named Caiaphas, who was the high priest, who I assume doesn't like Jesus, prophesied that Jesus would have to die to unite and heal 
the Jewish people. And on that basis, they go searching for him to capture him, kill him, and torture him. At this point, Jesus then, because there's all these people that are, he's like, to them, uh, I mean, they don't know what this is, but, they're, but he's getting mobbed. So he withdraws to a city called Ephraim in the wilderness, and there he waits. He waits for the time of his crucifixion. Out in the wilderness, just praying, just seeking God's face. Did he feel dread? I think so, maybe a little bit. But he knew that God would raise him from the dead. He knew he would have the victory, but he knew he would have to face the cross, which theologically wasn't just physical torture and public humiliation. They were hung naked. There was no loincloth or anything. They were beaten. But also we believe that Jesus took on his very body all the shame, sins, pain, loss of every moment of every human being throughout history, past, present, and future in one single moment. So powerful it caused an earthquake when he died. That's a lot of pain. And he knows it. He's so brave. And so he goes to Bethany again to visit his now resurrected friend Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, and they throw a meal in his honor and Mary washes his feet with her hair and perfume to prepare him for his death. And there, hundreds or maybe thousands of people are gathered to see Jesus because at this point, it's now Passover. This is what he's waiting for, one of the highest holidays in Judaism. And historians estimate that there are between 500,000 to 2 million people gathered in the little city of Jerusalem, which is a lot back then. I mean, it's a lot today. It was a lot back then. And everybody's asking, is Jesus going to come? Is Jesus going to come? After the celebration of the resurrection of Lazarus, all these people who are asking, did he really raise you from the dead? Did this really happen? And, and hundreds of people are like, we were there. We saw it. It was just a few days ago. It was crazy. They start, as a mob, walking towards Jerusalem. And a sea of people almost starts walking into the city. And it is that step that Jesus takes in Jerusalem bravely to face the cross. Everybody is smiling. Everybody is saying, Hosanna. I don't think Jesus is smiling. I think he knows what is coming. But he faces it. He faces it. He takes one step across the portal of Jerusalem and he knows he will never go back. But he also knows the power, the love, and the faithfulness of the Father that even if he dies, the Father would raise him from the dead. Tremendous story, isn't it? And after that, you see that those disciples carry their whole lives, most of them also martyred, just a deep sense of courage in the face of everything the enemy throws at them. They saw Lazarus raised from the dead, and even more importantly, they saw Jesus raised from the dead. And they knew. They knew. Being a disciple means having courage. It doesn't mean you're fearless. It means you're going to be scared a lot. But you're going to choose to go in the direction of the thing that scares you. God will call you to do scary things. You will be brave and have the victory. Courage begins with a single step. And can I tell you, being courageous in a scary world is the only way to live? Society gives you the opposite message. Society wants you to be safe all the time. Society is constantly telling you to be afraid of this, be afraid of that, whether it's news or politicians or your next door neighbor or some folks at church. People are always wanting you to do the safe thing. That is not the way to live. And Jesus tells us, well, if you live by faith, you can move a mountain. Courage is stepping toward the very thing you're afraid of, and you will. That's your character. You've got heart. You've got cur courage. To be courageous means to be alive. 
And very often what we do is instead of taking a step in the direction of the thing we're afraid of, we don't run away, but we get busy on other things. We do a little bit of this, and we do a little bit of that, and we keep going, and somehow that makes us feel like, I'll get around to it, but right now I'm kind of busy. And our busyness becomes avoidance. It's a way we avoid fulfilling our destiny. Because the only thing between you and your destiny is the thing you are busy avoiding. The only thing between you and your destiny is that big thing you're afraid of. God called you to do it because it's scary, and nobody else will. And that's why disciples must have heart. Heart to move in the direction of the violent, crazy, scary thing they're afraid of, rooted in the knowledge of God's character. God is faithful. He is strong enough. He is loving. He will give you the victory. But it doesn't mean it won't be hard work, and it doesn't mean it won't be scary. So whatever you're facing, my friends, I want you to know the word from God to you is don't stay busy, don't avoid, don't procrastinate. Take one small step in the direction of that big thing you're afraid of. Sometimes that's all it takes. I want you to know the victory is going to be yours. It's overwhelming to think about whatever it is that you're facing. If you look at the whole thing, sometimes it can be very worrisome. But remember the wise words of a wise man long ago who said, a thousand mile journey begins with a single step. That's right. Just take one step in the direction of the thing you're afraid of, and God will give you the victory. Amen? Amen. I don't want to let you leave here today, especially in a sermon about courage, without giving you the opportunity to know Jesus Christ. And so would you stand just where you are right now if you want me to pray with you to receive the Lord this morning? And so, church, we're going to say this together, and if you're standing at church, would you just extend a hand towards those, these people that are standing this morning, and you, friends, just hold your hands out like this to receive grace from God, and all of us, let's pray this together. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Son, of God, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me, a sinner. I am the righteousness of Christ. I am, the righteousness of Christ. I am chosen, I am chosen. Blessed, blessed, called. called. Fill, me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Forgive me of my sins. Teach me to walk as Jesus walked. In Jesus' name. Amen.